you for Dr. Swimming? Yes. You must be Swimming? Yes. I just, I, I received your email. Yeah. Okay. I received yours. Thank you very much <laughs> for uh, taking the initiative to find out what we're doing here. Yeah. I would like to know about your research project and with biofuels and how you guys are doing. The yeah. Whole. I'm happy to, to explain it to you. These are our babies. Okay. That is Digester 1. This is Digester 2. They're made of IBC tanks, which are international bulk container tanks. They're the ones you see on pallets, these white polypropylene tanks in the cages. Right. And they ship everything. And they ship everything from salmon roe for caviar. I mean, not caviar. That would be caviar. It's a different fish. Right. Salmon roe for sushi. They would ship in them uh, chemicals. They'd ship vegetable oil. You right. name it. This is the international container for that kind of worldwide commerce. And so right. they're pretty easy to find in every country in the world, which is why I decided after building biodigesters out of various local materials mm -hmm. that I would concentrate my efforts on something I knew everybody could get. Right. We were building in Alaska and we couldn't find the usual tanks we were using in Cairo or in Kenya or Tanzania. Mm -hmm. So we asked what they did have and there was a fish processing factory. Okay. And they had a bunch of these used. Okay. So we decided so. to modify to those. They're Perfect. a uniform size. They're each one cubic meter, which mm -hmm. is a thousand liters. Okay. In gallons, that's about 275 gallons. Do you fill that out all the way to the top? When you're yeah. Okay. We do, we do. So what we do is we take the empty container, which is light enough that two people can carry it upstairs. Right. Um, and you can roll them down the street if you have to when they're empty. So you can get them places. They're not, okay. they're not extremely heavy. I mean, the cage is about the heaviest part with the pallet. They're very robust. Mm -hmm. Then, to get them into a room like this, they're too big to fit through the door, so we removed the plastic tank from the cage, and we jumped on it until we collapsed it, okay. and put it through the door, and then and it then pops, pops back pops out, okay. a really strong plastic. Then we cut the cages in half, and that enabled us to then get the cages in the door, mm -hmm. and then we reassembled it and used zip ties, you can see that right. yellow zip tie. We zip tied it and screwed it back together right. so that the cage is holding. And then we insulate them with styrofoam right. so that they can Why? maintain their temperature. What we're trying to do is we're trying to simulate the stomach of a cow. Okay. Or stomach of a horse. Okay. These okay. animals have fairly large stomachs and in their stomachs are water and food and bacteria. Right. Uh -huh. So by simulating the stomach, then we feed it and the idea is if you start out by taking horse manure, so this is a bunch of horse manure, Okay. the horse manure has in it the bacteria that were found in the horse's stomach, cow manure would have the bacteria that are found in the cow's stomach, Okay. and that bacteria is a consortia of various microbes, some of which are methanogenic, meaning they produce methane, methane. Mm -hmm. they're anaerobic. They're dying right now because they're exposed to the air, but I'm hoping enough are kept alive in the center of any particular fecal pellet okay. that we can reconstitute them once they're underwater where there's no air. Right. And this is going to Manhattan for a mini digester that we're making. Okay. So we use horse manure. I used about nine bags of horse manure in there. So you add the horse manure, then you add water. Right. Warm water at body temperature. Body temperature. So okay. it simulates the inside of the so horse. So would it be different if you had the same setup outside? You'd always want it to be, yeah, you want it to be at body temperature, but they can survive and produce gas between about 13 degrees Celsius, mm -hmm. which is something like 50, 55 degrees Fahrenheit, all the way up to 45, on the outside, 50 degrees Celsius, which is okay. getting up toward about 140, I don't do Fahrenheit. Uh -huh. Yeah, like 140, yeah, something like that. So they, they have a range. Their optimal temperature is 37 degrees Celsius, which is 98.6, you know, body temperature. Body temperature, 98.6. Yeah, what that is. So, so you have the 37 degrees is what you want them at, but that's hard to maintain, and we don't worry too much about that. We fill them with warm water, we insulate it, and when we feed, we're going to feed with warm water. Oh, okay. And try to keep the temperature up, and we'll be monitoring it. But if it stays, and it probably in this room, because it's a warm room, it'll stay above 25 degrees Celsius. We should get some good gas Which is good. Okay. output. Uh, this is the cow's mouth. mouth. Yeah. This is the cow's mouth. This is his throat, or mm -hmm. her throat. Cow's and she. This is the 
esophagus, and it goes to about almost to the bottom, but it leaves enough space for the food to flow out. To flow out with the water that you're right. Ready for that. Okay. So imagine that the bottom of the tank is where the floor is. We're leaving a space and letting the food flush out whenever we feed it. How much water are you adding as well? Generally, you're adding the. The, this and the water. Well, this and the water first. You have to so be balanced. The water is in there already. Right. We we, okay. we filled this with water. We pour the manure in, and then we seal it and we let it sit for three weeks. Okay. And that's how long about it takes for the fermentation to occur and for the bacteria that are anaerobic to bounce back from the injury they received when they left the horse or the cow. Okay. So that takes about three weeks to build up the population. That's what's going on in this tank right here. How long has that been? That's been there for about a week. Okay. So it hasn't made any methane yet. It's still it's making gas, but it's making carbon dioxide. Okay. That's what happens for the first couple of weeks. Then eventually the CO2 content drops and, and the methane, methane level goes up, and eventually you get a mix of 70% methane, 30% CO2. Which is what you want? Or? Uh, you'd love to have 100% methane, but you're not going to get it. Okay. And you don't need it. It burns fine at 55% methane, 50% CO2, it burns. Okay. At 60-40, you've got really good burning. You can cook on it. You can run electric generators. You can do everything you can do with natural gas. Awesome. At 70-30, you've got a higher energy content per unit volume. And so if you could get it higher, you'd want to, but we don't worry about it. If it burns, we're happy. Okay. Good. It's free fuel. Okay. So we wait for three weeks for the methane content to get to the point where it's flammable. And once we light it and we know that it's flammable, right. that's when we start feeding it. Hold this if you don't mind for a second. Okay. And the way we feed it is we use one of these. Have you ever seen this before? Nope. Have it looked underneath your sink. Oh, really? Yeah, this is a this is just a standard incinerator evolution compact food oh. grinder. Oh, okay. So it's like a food grinder. Yeah, waste disposal. Some people call them garbage disposal. Oh, okay. We call it a feedstock preparation device. All it's right. It's feedstock for the biogas. And this company has been uh, supporting us, and they donated the incinerators for Mercy College nice. that we're using. So they donated four of them for us to use. And one will go in Manhattan, and one is here, and then there's going to be another one on a bicycle that's going to be here, not powered by electricity, but powered by human pedal power. Ah, uh, okay. For not only for exercise and workouts, so we can get those wonderful sculpted bodies, but also <laughs> because there's many places in the world that don't have any electricity. Right. They can still make biogas. So the incinerator food waste grinder is the teeth and jaws of mm -hmm. the sacred cow. And then it goes down the throat, and then it goes down the intestines. And ah. so that's the stomach of the cow. And then the cow has got a belch and fart methane. So we have this one here, which is at the top, mm -hmm. gas rises. So when this is in the tank, the gas will be at the highest point, and it will belch and fart out here. Okay. These pipes go to the middle of the tank. They'll be underwater. Even if there's gas building up, mm -hmm. they'll stay underwater. And they're going to take the pee of the cow, which is the fertilizer. Right. So you take that out. So that comes out the middle. And the reason it comes out the middle, maybe you can guess why. It comes out Gas what? has to come out the top. Okay. Because the water is all the way up up to here. Yeah, and if, if the gas is being produced, it could get as low as here. You don't want the gas to escape. No. The gas is from here. Right. The other reason, though, is because, is because if you imagine this being in the tank, as you put the food in and it goes to the bottom, mm -hmm. the protein and some of the carbohydrate will be more dense than water and will sink to the bottom and the bacteria will eat it and make gas, which will bubble up. Mm -hmm. But the lipids, the fats, float, right? Yes. You know, you see fat floats on the top of water. Mm -hmm. So the fats are going to rise to the top, and the bacteria are going to come and try to eat them and make gas. Okay. So you don't want to take your water out of the bottom or out of the top, because then you'd be taking energy-rich food out before the bacteria had a chance. Mm -hmm. So we put it in the middle under the assumption that after the bacteria have eaten the heavier solids on the bottom and eaten the lighter solids at the top, that the middle will be where the dead material is that's been eaten, and that's right. where we take our fertilizer out. So it's like an equilibrium. Right. And okay. the fertilizer will then contain everything the bacteria haven't eaten and a lot of stuff that the bacteria have added, and it's the richest fertilizer the world has ever known. Okay. Better than anything you could buy. Great for hydroponics. It's a liquid fertilizer. It comes out water-soluble. Everything right. is going straight to the roots of any plant you give it to. It doesn't sour the top. It doesn't block photosynthesis. It goes 
right into the soil to the roots. Mm -hmm. But it's got everything that you threw away. When you threw away your food, you were throwing away banana peels and potato peels and tops of carrots and right. things with dirt on them that you washed off. All the nutrients, the micronutrients, whether it's zinc or molybdenum or trace amounts of copper or it's uh, calcium, magnesium, everything is in the stuff we're throwing away. It's not in the food because we eat starch, basically. Right. And we throw the best part away. And that's the fertilizer that needs to make it back to the plants to keep the cycle of life going. Right. But okay. instead, we flush it down the drain and into the river and into the ocean, and it never gets back to the farm. And then farmers have to buy fertilizer and bring it to the farm. Uh, okay, so you're not only making the gas for energy, you're also making the fertilizer. The world's best for the most nutritious food. There can be no malnutrition because you're returning back to the soil everything that was taken out. Great. So the idea is that we would grow on this rack, which is now just filled with junk, we're going to grow plants for the cafeteria. And we're going to use the cafeteria waste, grind it up in measured quantities, make gas, use the gas to cook, Use the fertilizer, fertilizer to grow the plants, which go to the cafeteria, to be cooked on the gas, to be eaten, so that then the waste goes here and goes back in. The so only they thing, make a cycle. Right. And there's only one thing missing. What's that uh, in the cycle? If you grow food, eat it in the cafeteria, grind the food waste, put it in the tank, get the fertilizer, there's still a piece of fertilizer missing. There's still a piece of fertilizer yeah, missing. Yeah, so the, the, the cycle's not complete because imagine this starting at the beginning of the chain. You go to the cafeteria to eat. You eat. You take all the waste that you don't eat, you put it through the grinder into the biogas tank. Uh-huh. But what the about... Person. Stuff you ate. Right. So there's what you crap out. Right. That's fertilizer too. But you're not doing that well, one, We right? will. We have to. Okay. We, we have to investigate that. So we'll do a, a controlled experiment in this tank seeing if we take measured amounts of human or they call it. Right. I'm not going to make students do this. We're going to do it in a laboratory okay. every way. Okay. But taking human manure and figuring out how much gas content do you get from that and what kind of fertilizer, which we'll analyze, because we have all the equipment in here to analyze. Right. Looking at the bacterial count, looking at the coliform count, looking at the uh -huh. methanogenic. But your gut, just like a horse's gut, also has methanogenic bacteria that make biogas. Right. So we're going to do an experiment to see can we even start a reactor on human manure and how does it perform relative to one that starts on horse manure. To compare Be them. Because in the yeah. cities, in the burgeoning slums of the world, there are no horses. Right. But there's people. Right. And they have a source of bacteria in their own gut that they carry with them that can be used to turn their food waste into methane and into uh, fertilizer, uh -huh. and we're doing a, a workshop in Chad in Africa this summer, and we'll be building much larger than this one. big biodigesters in a prison, mm -hmm. and all they have are toilet wastes and kitchen wastes. Uh -huh. There's no animals. Okay. So we'll go out to Chad, one of the worst prisons in the world, wow. and it's filthy, and we have to clean it up. Similarly, we have colleagues who are building biodigesters in Nepal near Mount Everest Base Camp in a village called Gorak Shep, where we visited. And there's so many trekkers going up to Mount Everest that everybody's crapping all along the trail and it's causing water contamination for the villagers. Yeah. All this crap going into the river. So they're building a biodigester to take all of the human feces and ferment it and mm -hmm. generate gas to help keep the village warm because it's up in the frigid Himalayas. Right, okay. And we're going to be adding the component of the bicycle-powered incinerator that the engineers there have developed so that people without electricity can grind up the food waste right. and add that to enhance it. And that's because food waste has a hundred times more energy, roughly, than fecal waste. Right. Because when course. you eat the food, you use up all the energy to right. go jogging and disco sure, dancing. Digest it. Okay. But when you put it through here from the food waste, you get a lot more energy. So they'll use both the human manure and the food waste and get a lot of energy. Got it. Okay, it's a total solution. I mean, think of it. Definitely. All toilet wastes and all kitchen wastes, all market wastes, all slaughterhouse wastes, all can be biodigested, produce a safe, rich fertilizer, and safe, clean burning methane, meaning there will never be, if people adopt this cholera, typhoid, amoebic dysentery, all the waterborne diseases associated with people's crapping in water. I was going to ask about that. Finished, eliminated. When you put it in here, let's say somebody with cholera, you use their fecal waste 
that will not affect the whole experiment? That will not the, contaminate the whole No, thing? what would happen is that the Vibrio cholera um, bacteria would have to compete with a well-established colony of all these different microbes that are making methane. Mm -hmm. They go in there and they try to establish themselves, but it's not their environment, and so they would actually end up being killed and eaten, uh, reducing okay. the pathogenicity. Now that doesn't mean that we would take fertilizer from these and directly put it on the garden. No. We would never pour it directly into a river. Okay. What we would do is then take that fertilizer if we suspected somebody had cholera, if we're in a village where we don't know if people do or not, mm -hmm. and we would then aerobically compost that first and apply it to tree crops where the roots would destroy any other okay. pathogens. Okay. But mm -hmm. what wouldn't happen is it would never get flushed into the water supply. Okay. It would go to plants that could take care of it after it had been aerobically cured, after 99% of it had been cured in the digester. And that's the usual figure is 98, 99% of all pathogens are eliminated inside the tank. Which would definitely reduce yeah. the sickness and stuff. Right. So then you've got waterborne diseases finished, no problem. You've got fertilizers, so you have very nutritious food being grown. You don't have to worry about water because you're taking dirty water, gray water that has soaps in it and all the stuff that contaminates rivers and streams. Mm -hmm. You're putting the soapy water in there and the bacteria are eating the soaps right. because they're you know, um, glycerol and uh, fatty acids is what makes up soap. Mm -hmm. So soaps, yes, can kill bacteria when they're new, but after the soap has been used, it doesn't kill bacteria, bacteria eat it. And that's why gray water stinks, because the bacteria and eating the soaps. And even if they dilute it as well. Yeah. So we'll put the soaps in there, and the bacteria will eat it and turn that into fertilizer. Mm -hmm. So no more nutrification problems because of soap, phosphates, all the things that are bad for bodies of water are now safe because we're eating them. Okay. Getting more gas from that. So that takes care of that problem. And then you have air pollution. Methane is completely clean burning. No carbon monoxide, just carbon dioxide and water when it burns. Okay. A little bit of hydrogen sulfide, which smells only when the gas is not burned, which is good, because then you know if the gas has been left on, just like uh -huh. your gas problem. Mm -hmm. But when you do burn it, no smell. You cook on it in the house, no smoke, and that means thousands and thousands of women and children who are dying every year from respiratory illness, burning charcoal or firewood, never die again. Uh -huh. We're doing this in Tanzania near the Gombe Stream Chimpanzee Reserve. I'm thinking about the atmosphere as well. Yeah. And they don't have to deforest because there's no need for the women to go out there with their machetes and chop down firewood to bring it, haul it home. They travel two, three hours to get their firewood. They burn it in the hut. Never dying, their eyes are tearing. No, they just turn a tap. This is outside the kitchen. Clean burning methane inside. No more respiratory illness. Great. So we simultaneously solve waterborne disease, deforestation, indoor air pollution, um, sickness. sickness, it just, and energy problems, all of it, and, and agricultural. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're considering this the simplest of all development technologies that everybody needs to have as a baseline. So what would be the next step to make people do this regularly or make industries? Do industries this? already doing it. And Syncorator has a deal going with the city of Philadelphia where they're taking restaurant, cafeteria, and home organic waste. It goes to the waste treatment plant mm -hmm. through the water system, through the pipes, and then they capture the methane, generate electricity and heat with it, hot water, and sell it back to the city. Right. So Philadelphia's doing this, Milwaukee's doing it, Brooklyn started a pilot project. Stockholm, Sweden, they even run buses, trucks, and cars off of it. They wow. compress it and purify it. Great. Yeah, it's, it is solar energy that's available all the time because photosynthesis is where the energy is captured in the plant yeah. So it's the, the most obvious solution, and yet it's so unobvious to so many people. Yeah, because it's not widely used. Yeah. So we at Mercy will be pioneers, we'll be leaders. Great. Welcome aboard. Thanks. <laughs>